You're not bringing that on my boat, Gion pointed indignantly to the goat. He'd transported livestock plenty of times in the past. But this was different. No one asked him. And it was a goat. Their weird square eyes always unsettled him. Mr. Rogohi said we could. You have to do what he says. He's your boss, the portly man retorted. Much too loudly for a clandestine mission. Mr. Fucking Who? Doesn't matter. Fine, get below decks. And for the love of life. Be silent, Gion hissed with poorly suppressed rage. You can't talk to me like that. Do you even know who my uncle is? He said as he huffed up the gangplank. Gion shook his head and nodded at his passenger's bald spot. I assume dead for long centuries. You can be important later. Let's try being silent and alive just a while longer. Thankfully, the man and his goat had nothing further to say, and the stream of people kept pouring onto the wily wailing whale. Kinty's eyes scanned the dim shores. Captain, third group coming. Still no triangles. Gian's breath caught in his throat. Fuck, that's too many. I regret everything. His head pounded. The stress of the night unlike anything he'd experienced before. How many aboard now? Less than half, Kinty replied, his tone steady despite the tension. At this rate, I reckon we can expect maybe five groups. At least that many, he paused, then added. He didn't really say how many were coming. Did he? Just how many paid? Weird of you to let those be different numbers, if you excuse me saying. Jeon's gaze swept over the crowded deck. Right you are, but this city's on fire, and I can't stomach seeing folk burn, even strangers. He lowered his voice. Don't worry. If this goes to plan, you'll get the bonus of your life when we get back to that mage's town. The whole crew will. His men worked efficiently, loading people quickly and silently as they arrived. The ship groaned under the weight of so many bodies, more than Gaon had ever carried before. The next few days would be tense, but two bad days at sea were better than a nightmarish year in this purification. Where was the slim man? Rahogi, was it? I need the rest of the payment before we cast off. With the sun already set, there's maybe two hours until sailing time. Damn it! Even if I had the money now... We couldn't do anything with it. We'll sail with what we have. The ship was eerily quiet. No lights, no lanterns, the galley stove cold for days. Everything felt grey and lifeless, the silence oppressive. Everyone had been whispering for days, even though there was no one close to hear them. A commotion on shore broke the eerie calm. A squad of armoured inquisitors, maybe a dozen strong, marched down the wide harbour street. The jingle of their armour carried across the water, and Gion slowly backed away from the railing. Captain, you see them? Kinty whispered. Looks like our fourth group is hiding. I saw them a moment ago, but I've lost them now. Aye. Gion's response was terse. They couldn't leave until all were aboard and the conditions to open the gate were still a while away. A new thought struck him. Why couldn't he leave without them? They'd already paid. That really shifted the dynamics of their agreement. The patrol moved on, and soon the fourth and fifth groups reappeared, making their way down the darkened docks. One carried a bright lantern held high, a reasonable precaution on the treacherous walkway, but disastrous for a stealthy departure. Jeon fought the urge to shout a warning. Instead, he retreated to his quarters, retrieving his crossbow. He expertly spanned the heavy bow and loaded a sturdy iron-tipped quarrel. When he returned to the railing, he found one of his sailors had already reached the lantern-bearer and quietly extinguished the light. Fuck, Kinty hissed. Were you going to shoot the lamp or the guy? They're pretty far. Jeon shrugged non-committally. 
I had a few more quarrels in my pocket. With everyone finally aboard, Jeon went below decks to check on the passengers. The cargo hold was packed, people standing shoulder to shoulder, fear keeping them silent. Only pale reddish moonlight filtered through the open deck grates, giving them a ghostly appearance. Anyone seen your leader? Slim older fella? Jeon asked the shadowy crowd. A familiar voice responded, I'm here, just doing a head count. We're missing eight people. I think? I don't know where they are, so we have to leave without them. They knew the risks. Aye, we're still waiting on the tides, Gion replied. I'll stay as long as we can. He didn't like his options, but they'd come too far to stop now. Back on deck, Gion savoured the cool, salty breeze. He scanned the shore for stragglers, knowing their absence likely had grim implications. Lower the boat, he ordered. Take four strong oarsmen. Let's get started. As they prepared to cast off, Gaon spotted a small group sprinting down the dock, their footsteps unnervingly loud in the silent night. Hold up. Those are our stragglers. Lower the gangplank. Five people rushed aboard, upset and some in tears. Jeon's relief at their arrival was tempered by the knowledge that three were still missing. The city's ominous silence seemed to underscore the fate of those left behind. They got Tiami and his kids. We gotta go save them, one of the newcomers pleaded. They'll tell them which ship we were headed to. Not a chance. We're casting off this instant, Jeon said firmly. The boat was in the water already, and the final mooring line untied. Even as he spoke, the whale was moving towards the channel and the single gate. Head below decks, I've a tide to catch, or it'll be us in their clutches. The harbour had two points of entry, the complex locks, which allowed ships to pass through most of the day except during extreme tides, and a simple gate that opened briefly when the outside tide matched the harbour's level. Though the gate only opened for about an hour at a time, it was faster and cheaper. The faster part was what mattered tonight. The plan would be for the strike team to open the gate. They would flow out on the tide and be long gone before anyone was able to do something about it. The wind was a bit calmer than he'd hoped, and he already had a plan for how he'd tack out of the Bay of St. Augie. By mid-morning, they'd be in open waters and safely on their way. Just a bit longer now. Being back on his ship, sailing toward anywhere but here, was a balm to his soul. He hoped it would be a long time before he ever set foot in this place again. Even if the Inquisition left, he doubted he could ever feel at ease here. The leader of the refugees, the slim man, came up and greeted Gaon. I'm glad you waited. It would have been a shame to lose those last ones, even if Tiermi didn't make it. Aye, he didn't really wait for them, just the tides. He dismissed the praise with a shrug. I'll signal the men by the tower. It's time to start. Jeon nodded and grabbed the signal lantern for him. The slim man went to the bow, and while Gaon couldn't see the light, he could hear the snick-snick of the lantern's shutter. He scanned the direction of the control tower with his spyglass and saw nothing. So much was depending on five men he'd never met. Not even torches or lights, no sign at all of anything happening. The only sound was the whooshing of oars in the glassy water from the boat towing them. Far behind them a bell started tolling. Jeon raised his eyebrows. They didn't toll the time anymore. He sincerely hoped this was an unrelated disaster. That would be an excellent distraction. Setting something on fire before leaving would have been a good move. A shame I didn't think of it until now. A second bell started tolling, and small bobbling lights, distant torches and lanterns started appearing ashore. Well, that's not ideal. More friends of yours, I hope? Gion said with forced mildness to the slim man. No, fuck, one of my people might have broken under questioning. Fuck, we need to get out now! The man didn't raise his voice, but spat every word with hateful intensity. 
Agreed. I'll take your suggestion under consideration. Gaon had no order to shout that would get them out any faster. It was up to the strength in the arms of those men on the wall and the ones in the rowboat. I feel so damned helpless, but I can't dwell on that. The man stared at him before returning his attention to the gatehouse that controlled the gate they were slowly approaching. Jeon and his spyglass were much more interested in the shore. The number of bobbing orange lights kept increasing, and the bells were still tolling. He hoped no one he knew would be held responsible for their escape, assuming they escaped. Not that the Inquisitors really needed much of an excuse. He saw a great warship far to the east of the harbour come alive as its deck lights were lit. In those flickering lights, he saw it lower its sails. Thankfully, the wind was calm tonight, and it was barely moving. It had a single central ballista on its foredeck, and soon the deep thump of it firing echoed over the water. A splash a few paces off the whale's port side made their target all too clear. Stay calm. Those take forever to reload. We'll be away far before then, Gion shouted, since the time for subterfuge had clearly ended. He glanced back at the warship. Uh, they were well out of crossbow range, which was a relief. The few he had on board were no match for a warship's small arms, especially not the oversized naval bows it doubtlessly carried. They were getting closer and closer to the gate now. He could see the arcane marking on the timbers and the corroded metal that held them together. It was a relic from another time. Its millennia of durability was inspiring. They were still sealed tight. Their slow motion chase continued. His rowers were marginally faster than the empty sails of the warship, but until they were out of the gates and under sail, it wasn't especially important. Even straining to hear or see something, the gatehouse was the same as ever. Finally, the tower's lights went out and the gate started lowering straight down. The deep clacking of the gate's heavy mechanisms gave away what stealth they'd had left. Still, it was a glorious tune as every clack brought them closer to safety. His relief was short-lived. Another? Thump! was immediately followed by an ear-splitting crash as an iron-tipped wooden bolt, longer than he was tall, slammed into the stern of the whale. He flinched instinctively, then saw that his shirt sleeve was dark and wet with blood. A long, shallow cut ran down his arm, doubtless from the splinters of timber sent flying. We'll assess damage when we're clear. Steady the course, Gion shouted. He tore the sleeve of his shirt off and pressed it to the wound to staunch the bleeding. Despite the amount of blood, he didn't feel any pain as adrenaline pounded in his veins. The plan initially called for untying the rowboat and bringing everyone back aboard before transiting the gate, but they didn't have that kind of time anymore. Gion shouted down from the bow, Keep towing! Wait for my command to chop the rope! We'll recover you once we're through. So, I'll pull them aboard once we're out of line of sight of that fucking warship. Or not at all. No, I can't leave those poor sods behind. Not to those monsters. Even if it means giving up a lot of the head start. Oh, actually, how the hell are we going to get those soldiers off that tower? It'll take them a long time to swim out to us and nearly as long for me to send the boat to collect them. Maybe they have a plan. Maybe escape wasn't part of it. As the harbour gate met the water level, the glassy harbour became a waterfall pouring into the wider bay. Just as they planned, the water level was higher than the tide, giving them a fast but safe current to launch them out. As it lowered further, it flowed faster and faster and the whale started to pick up speed towards the exit, like a leaf on a stream. Cut loose. Get as clear as you can. I don't want to feed you to the keel, Jeon shouted, then dashed back to the helm without waiting for their reply. Kinty was already there, gripping the wheel with both hands. Jeon moved in beside him, shoulder to shoulder, and took hold. 
It took all their combined strength to keep the ship steady and aim for the gate. The whale drifted sideways on the current, and they struggled to steer her back to the center of the channel, even if it meant they weren't aligned straight anymore. Thump! Gion spun, eyes transfixed on the bolt streaking towards them. Unlike the other ones, this was easy to see. The firepot tip trailed long tongues of flame that lit the darkness behind them. Thankfully, the extra speed of the current moved them faster than the Inquisition gunners expected, and the fiery bolt crossed narrowly behind their stern, covering the water starboard of them in oily flames as the contents of the firepot burst harmlessly. Captain! Kinty gestured with his chin. They were sliding toward the gates nearly sideways, and the narrow opening wasn't wide enough for them to pass safely. With a grunt, Gion and Kinty cranked the wheel hard, forcing the ship to turn. The whale straightened just in time and shot through the gap as fast as a galloping stallion. Gion released a breath he didn't even know he'd been holding. The ship coasted into the bay, the sound of rushing water fading behind them. He glanced at Kinty, who gave a tight nod. They were through, but only just. For a moment, Gion felt the weight lift from his shoulders, though he knew the danger was far from over. Without taking any time to savor their escape, Gion ran to first the port, then starboard railings. Where's our rowers? Did they make it? Fifty paces dead ahead, sir. They are rowing to the boat's crane now, a sailor yelled back. Lower the crane. Get them aboard, fast, Gion commanded, not daring to look back at the rising gate or the approaching enemy ships. Where the hell are the soldiers? How exactly are we getting them aboard? The sea captain shouted to the slim man who'd stayed above deck for their transit. Behind them, the roar of machinery started again as the gate began to rise. Thump. Crack. Who in the damp hells is shooting at me now? Gion cried, his last nerve frayed to breaking. He quickly found the problem. A smaller arm-sized bolt was lodged into the starboard side of his hull. This one had a rope attached to it, a rope that was connected to the harbour control tower. For a brief moment the rope was pulled in until taut, causing the whale to rotate, then pitch sickeningly to port in the outflow of water. What the hell? Someone slice that barnacle off my hull! Even as he spoke, he drew his saber and approached the offending projectile. Captain, look! Kinty pointed to the harbour tower as a man was sliding down the rope, holding onto a leather strap. He let go before hitting the whale, splashing into the gentle waves. Immediately, the intruder swam towards the ship. Without sheathing the sword, he called out to the swimmer, You a friend of Karuk? No, sir, I am Karuk. Pass me a ladder and let's leave this shithole. I'm glad to hear it. You heard the man. Secure the ladder to starboard quickly now, Gion said to his sailors. Another man, and then another, then another came down the line, each splashing into the water near the ship. The last one let go much later and skipped along the water and thunked into the side of the hull, but seemed none the worse for it. With all five soldiers aboard, Gaon sliced the thin rope and ordered the sails raised. The snap of them filling with wind was the most satisfying sound he could have imagined. The wet soldiers went below decks, presumably to see their families, leaving Gion mostly to his own thoughts. The way the winds were blowing meant we'll tack straight out from the harbour gates, then we'll cut back north towards the mouth of the bay. Keep the lanterns dark. We don't want to make any other harbour defenseman's job easier. Get me a needle and thread. I have to close up a cut. Keep alert, everyone. We aren't safe and clear just yet. Jayon gave crisp orders as he crossed his deck, its familiar sway soothing him, reminding him of what he loved best, the sea and its endless possibilities. Sailing a dark ship in the dark night is recklessly dangerous, but tonight it was the safest place in the entire region. The gentle wind was moving him to safety, but not a fraction as fast as he'd like. They were still very much in range of those towers' ballistae. 
He went below decks, past the small crew cabin, and into the main cargo hold. The whale was a Nerian cog, a shallow bottom merchant ship with thick overlapping boards forming the hull. Easy to sail, sturdy in a storm with a huge cargo hold, it served his purposes well. Most every other ship in the sea might have been quicker, but not by much, and the ample hold was showing its value now. People were leaning against the sloping hull, sitting on the crates of ore and standing in clumps. They weren't packed tight, but it was unlikely they could all lay down at the same time. Is everyone okay? It got a bit exciting for a span, Gian said, with his best friendly sea captain voice. There was some sniffing and sobbing, but no one directly answered him. A goat bleated, testing the captain's remaining composure. Is that it? Are we finally safe from the Inquisition now? An exhausted-sounding man asked. Mostly. We're on the right side of the harbour walls, and we're making our way out of the bay. It's still a journey, to be sure, but the hard and dangerous bits are all past now. He chose his words carefully and optimistically. Seas Willin will dock in a little village called Pine Bluff in about two days. Heaps of ships go through that port, so you can find your way to the rest of the world from there. You can probably tell my whale ain't a passenger liner, so make do as best you can. Also, on account of our sudden departure, I wasn't able to take on as much food as I'd like. We should have a meal or two for each of you between now and there, but it'll be a bit thin. He could see his honesty wasn't being well received, and in fairness this lot looked a lot more delicate than most he'd dealt with. Join me in thanking Carrick for our daring escape. I'd love to hear the tale. The escape along the rope was... Captain, something's happening. Take a look, came Kinty's voice from above. Ah, my work is never done. I'll take care of this, and we'll all be safe in port before you know it. He smiled, bowed his head, and returned to the deck. When he emerged onto the deck, he could see what was happening without being told. The gate behind them was lowering. He could faintly hear the clacking of the mechanism from here. Well, that's not what I hope to hear, Gion said. He eyed its movement with his spyglass. They were beyond the range of the weapons now at least, but not by much. The calm winds meant they were escaping at about the same speed he'd walk. There was nothing for it but to watch. Slowly, the gate ratcheted down and down. He could see the lanterns festooning the bow of the warship that had been shooting at them earlier. The warship was massive, unmistakably a war carrack. Its hull was layers of thick oak making it impervious to most shipboard weapons, even among warships. A few hundred sailors manned the vessel, and knowing the Inquisition, nearly as many soldiers. The true threat lay amidships where the main armaments were concentrated. Fortunately, it could only engage with the single bow-mounted ballista while pursuing. The Carrack had four towering masts, each rigged with a complex web of sails and a sharp, menacing bow. She was far larger and much faster than the broad-bellied whale. Seas and tides, we might be in a bad way here. Any suggestions, Mr. Kinty? Put ashore on the other side of the bay? Let the refugees leg it and try to come back for the ship when they go to hunt them? His first mate shrugged, not liking his own idea, but unable to come up with anything better. Nah, I'm not losing my ship and cargo. Fuck. We gotta do better, Gion said with a frown. He watched the gate get lower yet, and water started pouring over it. Ho oh, there, look at that. Gion passed his spyglass to his first mate, so the tides here move fast. It's near a fathom lower than when we left. They can't leave now. It's too dangerous. Kinti peered through the glass, his expression grim. I think we both know how the Inquisition sails by now, sir. Jeon shook his head stubbornly. Its keel is far deeper than ours. No, it can't leave now. They have to raise the gate again. But even as he spoke, the massive warship began to move. 
The crash of falling water turned into a deeper roar as the vessel's bow dipped, starting rapidly forward on what looked like a steep slope of rushing water. With morbid fascination, the two men watched open-mouthed as the warship began to twist in the uneven rush. It was at least twice the length of the whale, and while no one would call the whale agile, this carrack was far less so. Shit, Gion breathed, his dumbstruck look turning to a grin. I bet his rudder isn't doing much. The water beneath him is moving faster than he is. It'd be like steering backwards. Kinty nodded, eyes wide. That's gotta be it. It's getting worse, not better. The flow of water was far faster than when the whale had exited, and that had been uncomfortable and dangerous enough. Their pursuer struck the side of the gateway amidships, shattering timber against ancient stones and tearing off a mast. The towering mast pinwheeled as the ship spun away without it, launching a number of unlucky sailors high into the air. A moment later, the keel snapped and the ship was torn in two, connected only by rigging and the odd stubborn plank. The uneven flow of water poured into the cracked hull of the ship, flooding it faster than Gaon could gasp. Water shot out of the weapon ports on the top deck, a bizarre sight that foretold the vessel's imminent doom. Excitement overtook Gaon's caution. If anyone would like to see an Inquisition ship get torn apart and sink, please come to the stern deck, he shouted to his passengers in the hold. Soon the deck was crowded with folk watching the ship being pulverized, rolled and torn in the torrent of water. The gate started to rise, ostensibly to stop the flow of water and give any survivors a chance. But there was still wreckage stuck against the mechanism, and they all watched in glee as it lifted a long chunk of the ship's keel out of the water. The strain grew too great, sending tons of wood plummeting into the swirling waters with a final, thunderous crash. All right, Gaon called out, his voice cutting through the murmurs of the crowd. Enjoyed the show? Good. Now back below, all of you. I hope that lifted your spirits as much as mine. We'll sort out a way for you to come up later, but first, let's get clear of this bay. With a gentle gesture, he ushered them all back below deck, all except the slim man who'd organized the escape. Turning to his crew, Gion barked new orders. Get those damned bolts out of my ship. Tie a line to them, though. I want to mount them both in my cabin as trophies. As the passengers filed back below and his crew scrambled to action, Gion allowed himself a moment of satisfaction. They weren't clear yet, but they'd just witnessed a miracle or at least the next best thing to one. The Inquisition's might had been shattered against the very gates they'd sought to control, and the wily wailing whale sailed on, battered but unbroken. The hull made no sound on the calm waters as they slid further and further from the occupied city. The slim man sat beside Gaon, and both men stared out across the dark, placid water. I've been an ass. You understand, though. It wears on you. The burden of leadership. Gion snorted. Aye, I know it well, but it ain't an excuse either. Eww. We aren't there yet, but we're alive and in one piece. I was under a lot of stress, and that's not my normal outlook. Thank you for all you've done. Are doing. I honestly wasn't sure I'd make it out of that place alive. Let alone with so many others. His voice was rough with relief. Sometimes we have luck on our side. Ready to tell me who the hell you are? Not that it matters at this stage, but I am a mite curious about why you needed to leave, and with so many others. I'm not a heretic or a criminal, if that's what you're thinking. My name is Pythalos Rogohi, a college-certified mage alchemist, and I fled to Wavegate to get out of the capital. I've just been just trying to do my work and collect my college stipend. Why leave? You're on the right side of the law, and ain't mages protected from the church somehow? That was more a tradition than a law, and the church is at a high ebb of power. It all started last spring. Did you hear about the demon attack on Jagged Cove? Regardless, that night changed a lot. 
The Inquisitors demanded access to the entire college, violent skirmishes started all over town, and the College of Magic reactivated the Order of Erudite Battle, our own armed wing as a counterbalance. Shit. Jayon hadn't heard things had gotten that bad. He hadn't been to the capital in most of a decade. Jayon rose, rubbed his tired eyes, and gave some more orders to his men. The lanterns and stove were to be lit, the sails trimmed, first shift to rest, and the remaining crew to start repairing the damage from earlier. I'm sorry, please continue. You're saying that the college is at war, with the church in jagged? Gaon took in the results of his orders even as the slim man spoke. Rahogi continued, Not exactly, but close enough. I'm not a fighter, and I don't care for their games or political maneuvering, so I came to the other side of the sea for some peace and quiet. Then this Mickle's heresy falls on my damned lap. It's a damn mess. And now I have to flee again, with basically the clothes on my back. Funny you should say that. I spoke to another mage not long ago. He left the capital around the same time. Seems he's landed on his feet. Gion wasn't sure how much more to say. Most of what he knew was rumors and speculation. He smiled as two sailors hoisted the huge bolt they'd pulled from the ship's stern. Rahogi looked intrigued. Really? Did you catch his name? That would be a boon to have another man of learning in my retinue. Mage Grigory Petrov Thippoli. At least that's how he signs his notes. Seems to have become a bit of a local power himself. No, he isn't. I've never heard of him. And I keep track of every noteworthy mage in the Empire. You were likely taken in by a conman. That said, I'd very much like to meet this conman and put the fear of a real wielder of the mystical arts into him. Rahogi said, with fresh vigor and confidence. Gaon sat in silence, watching the shores slowly pass by in the pre-dawn light. I don't know a damn thing about magic, but I do know when to steer clear of a storm, to the tides with both of these men. All I need is to keep my ship and crew safe. Get paid, get gone. Simple as that. Sounds like a problem best left to my betters, Gion said cautiously. But since I've got business with him, I'd be happy to make the... Captain! Red sails on the horizon! Two of them! The sentry called out. Gion's shoulders sank in exhaustion, and with effort he regained his composure. You'll have to excuse me, Mage Rahogi. Gion went to the stern railing, raising his spyglass towards Wavegate. The horizon was still cloaked in night, with only the faintest hint of dawn. He squinted, trying to make out the shapes in the dim light. The hulls of the approaching ships were just visible, low on the horizon. Their square sails, combined with a lateen on the mizzenmast, told him all he needed to know. Pinnaces. Fast, narrow, and built for pursuit. Though each was barely a tenth the size of the whale, they were a serious threat. They must have cycled through the main locks. If I were their commander, I'd send these pinnaces to slow us down, plink us with firepot arrows until we're out of men or sails. Then the real warships can close in to finish the job. They're the fastest ships in the Navy, but even at their speed, it'll be a while before they're in range. At least the wind favors us, with it largely at our back. That should buy us some time. But time for what? <laughs>